Hey everyone, my name is Kyla. Welcome to my channel where we talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. This is the Everything That You Need to Know series, a series of different primaries where we break down everything that you need to know about the stock market, the economy, and the crypto market. Today, we are going to be doing a very thorough analysis of Evergrande. I talked about Evergrande two times so far on my channel, but the news came out again today that they're getting closer and closer to defaulting on their debt. And so it's like, oh, what's Evergrande going to do this time around? If you want to go ahead and hit subscribe, that would prevent me from defaulting on my offshore funds. <laughs> So let's talk about it. What I'm going to talk about today are the themes that are existing within Evergrande's crisis, a high level overview of the different impacts that this is having across the government, across the country, across the world. And then of course, going a little bit deeper into the monetary policy aspect of it, the financing aspect of it, and then the eventual implication. I did two videos on Evergrande, so I'm going to recommend that you go watch those. But this one will obviously include all the key points that you need in order to understand the situation. I'm going to have a PowerPoint presentation about this. And then I have sort of an animation style that I think will help to clarify some stuff too because it is so confusing. For a very high level overview, Evergrande is a very big property developer in China. It has a bunch of different arms and it has a ton of debt. So it has $300 billion in liabilities and all of that debt's coming due and Evergrande has been flirting with a default. So flirting with not making these debt payments back and the Chinese government, Beijing, was like, okay, we'll step in sort of if things get too bad. Like everybody was assuming that but then things keep on getting worse and worse. China, for the first time, stepped in today with PBOC reducing the reserve requirement on banks in order for banks to lend out more money into the economy and introduce a little bit more liquidity, make it so these real estate companies and these property developers could essentially get more money. And the reason that Evergrande is struggling so hard is because Beijing, the Chinese government, has cracked down on property developers, especially private property developers like Evergrande, because they're so over leveraged. They have so much debt. And so Beijing does not like that. They say, hey, you have way too much debt. Get that stuff figured out. It's gross. Because of that, they have introduced regulatory requirements that makes it really hard for these debt-laden companies to essentially finance themselves. So not only does Evergrande have a ton of debt, but it's becoming very difficult for Evergrande to deal with its existing debt. What do you do, especially for Evergrande in a country where 20% of the real estate is vacant, but real estate is 30% of GDP? So really that's the big situation in China and with Evergrande is that Evergrande is this big ghost real estate property developer who has just balls to the wall leverage. China does not like that because China wants to move forward with a new sort of economic model that encourages more sustainable growth, encourages domestic consumption. There are a lot of implications from doing that, and I'm going to talk about all that today. Then to quickly walk through this PowerPoint. All right, what is happening in China with Evergrande? So let's get into it. First off, you have the property sector. So this is all the real estate companies in China. This is what they're going to be doing in order to build out homes, infrastructure, property. These are very over leveraged, so they have a ton of debt and they have a lot of non-productive growth. So you just kind of build ghost buildings and those ghost buildings just sit there. And one of these property sector companies is Evergrande, who is a very big company that has quite a lot of debt. And then there's another company called Sunshine 100. And so Sunshine 100 just missed a payment on $179 million worth of debt and their shares fell 87%. So Sunshine 100 is kind of a leading indicator of what could happen with Evergrande here. And there's a bunch of other little baby companies out here. Evergrande has about $300 billion in liabilities. They have a couple of options with dealing with the amounts of, amounts of debt that they have. So they can either default or they can restructure. If they default, that would lead to a lot of cross defaults and that would be very, very bad. If they restructure, that would mean that they take their offshore public bonds and private debt obligations and figure out a way to make them a little bit more appealing and safe to the market. There's also lenders within this big ecosystem. So lenders, you know, property loans rose $31 billion this year and they're very vulnerable to mispayments. So they've got to make sure that they're getting their money back from their investments. There's trust firms that sit within this lender arm. They're investors, they're wealthy individuals who pull their money together. This is a $3 trillion industry and currently dealing with $10 billion worth of defaults. Real estate is approximately 30% of those defaults already. With Evergrande, that could be even worse for these big, big firms. And they have $5 billion of exposure in high yield products to Evergrande right now. They also 40% of total borrowings come from these trust firms that Evergrande has. So they have a lot of money tied up in Evergrande. And if they default, so if Evergrande defaults, these trust firms are going to experience the pain 
pain of that. There's also the People's Bank of China, and so they reduced reserve requirement by 50 basis points today, but that was not easing. It was just a cut. You better get that straight or else they'll come after you. <laughs> That's a pretty big difference because they don't want to have their monetary policy be seen as easy by the rest of the world. They want to show that they're still going to be prudent about their monetary policy. It's just to help with liquidity. Here we go. The aim of the RR cut is to strengthen cross-cyclical adjustment, enhance the capital structure of financial institutions, raise financial services capabilities to better support the real economy. So that's the goal with the cut there. And what this did is it freed up $1.2 trillion worth of one and $188 billion in liquidity. And those are expected to go all throughout the market and make things a little bit easier for people. So if you were like, I need some money, this is supposed to help you. And they basically have said to everyone several times, you know, manage your debt better. And then there's Beijing. So Beijing is the Chinese government and they've made it pretty clear how they feel about this kind of stuff. So their goal is to grow, but do not grow with debt. Stop taking on debt. It's bad and it's really bad and we want to avoid it at all costs. And so they told the PBOC, you know, grow, but be prudent in monetary policy. It's not easy. It's very difficult to do. They put in these regulatory constraints that made it very, very hard for Evergrande to function and they dried up their liquidity. And then they've said this to local governments. So you are responsible for GDP growth. You cannot use your money for luxurious offices and vanity projects. You could only use this money to be productive. Local governments are like, well, I can't grow without debt. The property sector isn't buying anymore. They do this thing called the local government financing vehicle where they'll buy land, borrow from the bank, and that, that will be counted as revenue. That's how they keep that local government alive, essentially. The LGFV, you know, says to Beijing, oh, this this is hidden debt that you can't see because it, it gets hidden into the system. Beijing is like, no, we can still see it. Cut it out and use these special purpose bonds instead in order to finance your projects because there's so much hidden debt in these local government financing vehicles, a massive amount of debt hidden in there. And that's really problematic. And then there's banks. So banks are obviously going to help the local government financing vehicles get money. And Evergrande owes them money, you know, $82.5 million in debt repayments and $260 million demanded by creditors. Banks are just kind of balanced balancing on a lot of different things and the liquidity issued from the PBOC will help them. A ton of companies that could potentially default and they might have to step in. And Evergrande, you know, to Beijing, who has been to Evergrande, you know, stop borrowing so much money. Evergrande, finally, real estate is 30% of GDP. Stop constraining it. And, and that's an important point too. And this was Evergrande. I, I do want to address some common themes that I've been seeing and I think that are important to address. This is theme number one, which applies across a broad range of markets. Rising volatility seems to cause contracting liquidity, which each reinforcing the other in either direction. These kinds of mechanisms can become suddenly destabilizing. This is from Michael Pettis. He is an incredible researcher on China news and I highly recommend that you go follow him. The whole idea here is that as volatility increases in the market, that can reduce the amount of dollars that are floating towards different things. So if you have a lot of volatility, people People are going to be like, okay, at first maybe, but then as more and more fear enters into the market, less and less people are going to want to have those volatile assets in their portfolio and they're not going to want to have that exposure. That's pretty much theme number one across all markets at the moment. And then theme number two is Beijing. So the Chinese government is essentially a snake eating its tail. So they don't want to be associated with debt, but that's really the only way that they're going to grow. And that's the only way that they have grown is investment in non-productive assets in order to spin up their economy. They grow primarily through these non-productive property investments and infrastructure. And so their whole idea is they, they told everybody, hey, you know, reduce your debt. We don't want to deal with this. We're going to crack down on excessive use of debt and we're going to embarrass you in front of everybody. Well, kind of what they're doing with Evergrande almost. But the issue is that China wants to turn away from debt-fueled growth, but how else are you going to grow? <laughs> then theme number three, so infrastructure at this point, which is non-productive investment, is the only way that they're going to be able to grow. But the problem is, is that there's hidden ample debt risks within the this model. So from the tools that local governments are using to grow, because the Chinese government in Beijing is like, hey, the only way you local government, you're responsible for growth, you better get that figured out. And so local governments are like, well, we can't borrow excessive amounts because Beijing is cracking down on the property sector because of the excessive amounts of debt. Property companies aren't going to go invest in local governments. They're not going to buy plants because they're dealing with Beijing. So really the big problem here is that local governments are using things called local government financial financing vehicles and special purpose bonds in order to essentially borrow money, buy land, and print that as revenue. But really, it's just staying within them. They're borrowing money from a bank. They're buying up land and then saying that that land and that revenue from the bank, the borrowed money, is revenue. And that's really not great, right? Like, that's very unstable and, and probably not the best way to, like, call me crazy, but probably not the best way to grow. <laughs> then theme number five, the real estate sector is really like a big contagious bug right now and people are cutting back their investments in the space 
this trust specifically and trusts are these big pools of wealthy individual investors which could put pressure on banks to step in what is the real estate sector going to do who's going to invest in it there's really no replacement right now for property and infrastructure as as a driver for growth but you can't just like spend money into oblivion so china's trying to figure out that very very that very very hard balance right now and so at a high level, there's a couple of different things. So right now, the PBOC, so the People's Bank of China, came out and they're like, we're going to reduce the reserve requirement for Chinese banks by 50 basis points. And essentially, that'll allow Chinese banks to lend out more money, to do more financing, and essentially get the whole thing up and running. But China has been very clear that they, they do not want to have an easy monetary policy. And they're kind of mad at the world because they're like, hey, you know, we should really collaborate on monetary policy because it's not fair that you're able to sort of do all this stuff and, and engage in this way with your interest rates and we should all talk about it because it would be much more effective if we just talked about it. By them raising the RRR by 50 basis points, they so they were very clear that this was just a cut and not monetary easing, but it looks like a cut. That's like literally what monetary easing is, is, is messing with the reserve requirement. And so that's interesting is that their monetary policy is diverging from the direction that the rest of the world is hoping to go. And then point number two, the reason that they're doing all of this is because the economy is pretty unstable right now. So they're trying to inject liquidity into to the economy because the economy seriously needs it. But the problem is that Beijing does not want to accept a very sharp slowdown in growth and they can't allow an interruption to the rapid expansion of credit. Delevering is slowing down. Really, it's just a huge mismatch in expectations. And the third point here is the property sector needs financing, but it also doesn't need financing. So bank credit is being rolled out to these big property developers. But the issue here is that trusts have already defaulted on $10 billion of developer-linked products. So trusts, again, are these wealthy individuals pooling together assets that's already $10 billion of developer-linked products have defaulted uh, this year, which is terrible. And now there's a lot of pressure on existing Chinese developers to kind of get their act together. They have tightening policy, and everybody's really worried about what's going to happen with Evergrande. And also another property developer this morning called Sunshine 100 defaulted again, cross default. So because this property developer has defaulted, presumably other property companies are going to default too, because one domino tips and everybody tips over, and that's kind of the situation with that. Right Right now, China has, so really they're trying to spur this idea of domestic demand and that exists at a local government level. And so local governments are responsible for spurring up a certain amount of GDP growth, pretty much all of the GDP growth. But they've been very clear to these local governments, Beijing, the Chinese government has, that they're not allowed to use debt on luxurious office buildings and halls, vanity projects and unnecessary landscaping works. They shamed eight local government projects in four Western provinces over their loose debt policies and told local officials to strictly follow fiscal discipline. Really, it's just, again, this big mismatch between what local governments are able to do in terms of meeting those GDP growth targets that China has set out versus what is actually plausible. Right now, they have an increasing mismatch between retail consumption, so domestic consumption, and industrial production. So industrial production is much, much higher than retail consumption. So you have consumers not demanding nearly as much as the more industrial side. That's a big misbalance, and you don't really want to have that misbalance in your economy because if, if your industrial production is growing but their consumers aren't meeting to match that you have a misbalance so you want to have that that weight even on both sides really that's that's a big problem for them they're trying to grow so they're trying to achieve you know growth rates above two to three percent but that will require likely and this is from michael pettis a four to six percentage point increase in their debt to gdp ratio so taking out more debt chinese banks likely funding more non-productive investment in property and infrastructure here again you know they're betting that this investment in infrastructure spending is and really get out of this property-led slowdown that they've been in. You see Turkey trying to do the same exact thing. Turkey came out and the president came out and he was like, hey, we're going to follow China's model. We're going to invest in infrastructure spending. And it's like, okay, dude, like that works to a certain extent. But if you're just building ghost real estate, that's not going to work in the long run. But you have to have high property prices alongside high property debt. Because if you have just a ton of debt and your products aren't supporting that, uh, real estate is 30% of GDP, but 20% of properties are vacant. That's a really big mismatch. That's not something that you kind of want to see. Government wants to control property development now, probably. We're going to see the government step in and real estate will likely still be 30% of GDP, but who knows how much more properties will be vacant because the government seems to think that this is the best way to grow the economy. So it, it'll be very interesting. Then getting a little bit deeper into the RRR cut. So China cuts bank reserve requirement ratio by 50 basis points in order to provide a liquidity boost to the economy. The PBOC said that the aim of the RRR cut is to strengthen cross cyclical 
cyclical adjustment, enhance the capital structure of financial institutions, raise financial services capabilities to better support the real economy. Essentially, they're like, we need banks to lend money so we can get this show on the road. They want the bond market to have a little bit more funding. They want people to be able to go into the market and get bonds issued and get buy bonds up. They're trying to get more capital into the banks and then get more capital out into the economy. The whole goal is to support small businesses, but we'll see if that actually ends up happening. But essentially what that does is it releases $188 billion or 1.2 trillion won of liquidity, which should be helpful. Evergrande is here still. So they're unsure if they can make their $82.5 million debt repayment and the tick $260 million demanded by creditors. So they have that coming after them. And then of course, they have their 300 billion dollars in liabilities and because of what happened you know with Beijing you know clamped down on borrowing and that led to a lot of offshore debt defaults a lot of credit rating downgrades and a lot of sell-offs in bonds and Evergrande cannot raise capital because nobody wants to buy their products like they have Evergrande Fairyland they have Evergrande EVs they have like a water bottle company they have all this random stuff and nobody wants their assets like it's just useless growth imagine that you went to the dollar store and you bought like a bunch of cheap little toys and you were trying to sell them for like five thousand dollars nobody would want to buy them nobody would want to buy them because it's just not appealing it's not quality that's the issue that Evergrande is running into and also with these trusts these wealthy individuals and their money there's probably five billion dollars in high yield products linked to Evergrande. And there's already been 10 billion of defaults this year. So think about that one. Another half of their defaults coming up again if, if Evergrande does default. And these uh, trusts are 40% of Evergrande's borrowing. So just massive exposure from these wealthy individuals into Evergrande. And Evergrande, you know, the idea is, okay, so they have one of two options. They can default on their debt or they can restructure their debt. And they're going to try and avoid default at all costs because if they default, essentially they're underwater, people lose money. It's really bad. That's when you see contagion across the system because people aren't getting paid. They're not able to pay other people and then those people don't, aren't able to pay other people and it just it's a huge cascade of problems. So with Evergrande they're going to restructure some of their debt so their offshore public bonds and private debt obligations. If they did default they would be the second biggest emerging markets corporate default after what happened in Venezuela. Really quite bad. Really really quite bad. I think just to touch on the local government's idea so the local governments are responsible for meeting a lot of the demands of Beijing and a lot of the demands of GDP growth and the way that they're doing this right now is they used to just sell land to property developers like Evergrande, but obviously they can't do that anymore because of the clampdown. They now have really the option, this is from Michael Pettis again, supporting household income and domestic consumption rather than non-productive investment. So Beijing is like, you've got to get it together. You have to find a way to sort of spur both of these things up. And because property developers are not buying up land, they have no really big source of revenue like they used to. And so they're turning to these things called local government financing vehicles to buy the land, which are controlled by local governments and they borrow under guarantees from banks and then those guarantees are essentially used as revenue which is weird the idea here is that they sell the land eventually if they don't have a buyer for that land eventually that would that would be bad that would be awful that would be terrible what it really does is it hides debt because it looks like revenue but it's actually debt Nomura had a note that this essentially amounted to 445 trillion won back in April who knows what it's at now local governments don't have a lot of money and land selling was one of the ways that they got money but now the Beijing Chinese government stepped in. They were like, don't do this. And so through these vehicles, these LGFEs, local government financing vehicles, they've bought 13% of land parcels <laughs> through July to November of this year. So just in this last quarter, they bought 13% of value of the land parcels for sale in China, which is, yeah. So Okay, and I also have a little animation that I made that hopefully can explain things a little bit more. Hey, you're super overlevered. Yeah, it's really bad. I have $300 billion in liabilities. I'm gonna get the theft out of you. Oh no, you can't curb my borrowing like that. I need it. I need to borrow. Nope, no more debt, just growth. We literally just grow unproductively. 20% of our real estate is empty. I'm clamping down. Real estate is 30% of the economy. WTF are you doing? Figure it out. Our entire economy is built on non-productive assets. Oh no, okay. <laughs> Listen, I'm literally gonna default. No one wants to buy my assets. Listen, I cut the RRR by 50 basis points, so now banks can lend more. Oh wow, thank you. Thank you. Hey, you need to restructure your debt. Yeah, you know, I'm trying. <laughs> by the way, that was not monetary easing. We are using prudent monetary policy. Um, okay. Thank you. 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 Thank if you don't pay, we're in trouble. Oh, yikes. If you default, we have to pay bills. We're struggling. Oh, wow, yikes. 
hey can you pay please okay it's time to restructure our offshore public bonds and private debt obligations okay but you still owe 82 and a half million dollars in debt repayments and creditors are demanding 260 million dollars oh no the money is going towards soes wait what we will own everything oh my gosh you must grow in order to meet our growth goals we have to increase debt to gdp by four to six percent okay cool more non-productive investment no absolutely not absolutely no spending debt on luxury that's bad how do you expect us to do that <laughs> i said no luxury spending okay well what do we do support household income and domestic consumption but one of our primary revenue models is selling land to property developers they don't want it anymore though because of you well property developers are in trouble because of debt that could be you if you're not careful okay we'll use local government financing vehicles then they'll buy the land right yeah th these proceeds are revenue <laughs> borrowed from bank land desires yeah it works this effectively is hidden debt my friend and it could turn out very badly no that's wasteful and you should use special purpose bonds instead that is not enough money to fund infrastructure spending well don't worry we have a variety of tools at our disposal <laughs> oh my gosh and so that is essentially <laughs> that is what's happening with evergrand hopefully this was helpful um, I know it's kind of quite a lot and it's a lot of very detailed information. Yeah, it, it was fun to make all these little drawings. I hope they were a little bit helpful in sort of deciphering what's going on. Thanks so much for spending time with me. I will be back tomorrow. Uh, I have a piece coming out with Ben this week as well, just around the broad market. And we're also filming around all this stuff happening, you know, tether situation, situation with uh, Evergrande and a lot more stuff, Olympics. Let me know if you have any thoughts, feedback, comments, question. This is my shirt. I will see you soon.